stewardship. It's kind of a churchy word, but what does it mean? This is stewardship plain and simple. Meet John. He loves to play golf, eat Italian, and go to the movies. He has a house, a car, and a job that pays the bills. In his free time, he catches up on the latest game, and he plays his guitar. So here's where stewardship comes in. Everything John has, from his TV, to his car, to even his ability to play guitar. Well, none of it actually belongs to him. Are you ready for this? From the little things, all the way to the big stuff, like his house, it all belongs to God. You're a steward of everything God gave you. It's a privilege, and he expects you to be responsible, not just with your finances, but your time, talents, and toys. So what does it mean to be responsible? Well, like hosting a Bible study at your house, or using your free time to visit someone in the hospital, or how about giving money to an out-of-work friend? It's all stewardship. So when it's time to give back, say the plate gets passed, or the children's minister asks you to serve in the toddler's room again, think to yourself this one simple question. Does what I have belong to me or God? About this time last year, I introduced a principle to you. And this last week, as I was preparing, I actually had several people come up and ask me some questions about this principle that I think is absolutely critical if we're going to understand this series that, of messages that we're talking about. We're in a series called The Dance. And the intention of this series is to help every one of us in this room understand what it means to walk in intimacy with God. To not have a religion, but to have a true, vibrant relationship with God. One that is it's not what we're doing to show God, but rather what we're doing to experience God. And I think the foundational principle of all this is very simple. If the Holy Spirit is not guiding your life, if you are not living under the influence of the Holy Spirit, then you're living less than the Christian life that God outlines in Scripture. It doesn't mean you're not Christian. You become a Christian because you receive Christ your Savior. But the Christian life is about walking in the Spirit. It's about experiencing God, communicating with God. And I think what happens to so many people is that they, they, they get saved, so to speak, but then they never live the Christian life. They live unplugged. The, the abiding life that God talks about in John 15 is a life that's plugged into God, not unplugged from God. And so last year I taught this principle, this precept about two different people in the world. And you may remember this. There are lost people and there are found people. There are people that are saved and there are people that have yet to experience the grace of God. Now in this there are two types of people who are lost. There are what I call the lost lost or the rebellious lost and then you have the religious lost. And I shared this last Sunday a little bit just to kind of give you a sneak peek. This is really the heart of the story of the prodigal son. Because in the story of the prodigal son, we have the son, we have the younger son who was rebellious and went away and squandered his life. But then we have the older brother who stayed at home and we know that God was talking about the Pharisees and the, and the religious people who were just so religious but yet they were still just as far from God. Those are the two types of people. Whether it's your neighbor, whether it's you, whether it's, whether it's a, a, a family member, every person who is separated from God because they've never received the grace of Jesus Christ for salvation, they are in one of these two camps. That's not what I'm going to focus on today. There's a point in which we come to salvation. Where we, where we realize that we're sinners. That Jesus died for us. And the Holy Spirit convicts us and woos us to himself. 
and we receive him as our Savior. In that very instant, we go from lost to found. We go from unborn to spiritually born. And our salvation is secure. But then we have a responsibility. And when we're saved, we fall into one of two camps. We are either carnal. That is, we live a manufactured Christian life. It's done under our human power. Or we live a spirit-led Christian life that is surrendered and it's under God's power. This is the abiding life that Jesus is talking about in John 15. All through the book of Romans, all through the book of Galatians, it's trying to help us to understand the difference between lost and found, but then also the difference between living the Christian life in my ability versus living the Christian life in God's power. Now, why is this relevant? Because the, the, in the dance of the Christian life, God is not focused on teaching us how to dance in our ability. He wants us to follow his lead. He wants us to enjoy and experience intimacy with him. You will never find intimacy with God living the Christian life in your ability. The only way to find intimacy with God is to live under the Spirit's control, to live in communion with the Spirit. Because the Spirit is who God has given us to guide us. So when I open up the Bible, when I read it, I might understand the information, but for transformation to occur, according to to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, the Spirit of God has to reveal it to me. When I pray, if I'm praying by the Spirit, if I'm, it, it, it's, it's God who says, pray this way. If, it, no matter what the discipline of the Christian life, it requires obedience to the leading of the Holy Spirit. That could not be more true in the next step we're going to talk about today. The step of stewardship. Stewardship for many people, it, it, I mean, I, I think in some churches it causes the, the renting of clothes and the weeping of gnashing and teeth when people talk about money. Because we immediately, you know what happens when, when we start talking about finances or start talking about stewardship, whether it's our time, our talents, our tongue, our temple, our treasure, no matter what it is, we immediately pull back. And here's the scary part. If you're pulling back, the reason you're pulling back, the reason that I pull back is because I'm moving, I'm resistant to being spirit-led and I want to live the Christian life on my terms. You ready for this? There is no such thing as living the Christian life on your terms. It's not the Christian life if it's on your terms. The only way it can be Christian if it's under God's terms. And so we come to this incredible principle. In fact, this is the one step of the dance in the Christian life that reveals more about the condition of our heart and whether we're abiding or not. It's stewardship. But I want to I I just change the whole. I want you to take money off the table. I want you to take everything off the table today and understand this principle. Stewardship is about relationship. It's not about money. It's not even about the tithe. It's about relationship. And so in the spirit dance, when we begin to dance with God and we begin to be intimate, it's amazing what happens. We're not giving so that we get God's blessings. We're giving because we're responding in relationship and a relationship of intimacy with God. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing. Because we are walking in the nature of Christ. Now, how important is this? This very topic, Jesus speaks. Let me ask you this question. Why did Jesus step out of heaven into flesh and die on the cross to pay for our sins? Why? He did it because he loves us, but he did it because there was no other way for our sins to be forgiven than the cross. In other words, salvation was the reason God stepped in the flesh and died for us. The reason we celebrated the cross is because every one of us were lost and he came to pursue us to rescue us from our lostness. Are you ready for this? 
He speaks twice as many times about the issue of stewardship than he does salvation. And yet the reason he came to earth was for our salvation. Why? It's because he knows that this issue will be the issue that keeps people from the cross. This one issue will keep people from receiving the grace of God because they want to amass stuff instead of surrender to Christ. Webster defines stewardship as the responsibility of managing the assets, affairs, and property of someone else. Of someone else. It's managing something that's not your own. You got that? And the key word there is management. Let me, let me explain. How many of you do not, how many of you work for somebody? You work for a corporation. You, you don't work for yourself. You, you don't own the company. How many? Raise your hand. This is participation. How many of you used to work for someone? Forgot which service I was in. <laughs> Oh, that's funny. <laughs> now, <laughs> when you considered your occupation, what, what we've got to understand is that you worked for someone else. You worked at the will of someone else. Now, it doesn't mean you always liked what you did. It doesn't mean you always liked the decisions that your boss has made. But the fact of the matter is, the place where you worked had an objective. You were a steward of that organization. How you managed your time, your talents, your, your, your abilities, your resources determined the success of that company. The same principle holds true in biblical stewardship. We are not the ones who get to call the shots. We serve at the will of the Father. Our, we, we serve at the will of his grace. And we're managers of those things that he has blessed us with, that he's imbued us with, so that we can accomplish his purpose. Now, what are those things? Well, there's several. One is your treasures, your money. Second is your time. Third is your temple, your body. Fourth is your tongue. Imagine what happens if God got the first tenth of every conversation you had. How would that affect the other 90%? Eey, that's nasty, isn't it? And then your testimony, your reputation. These five areas make up what God has gifted us with and God expects us to be managers, stewards of these resources so that the will of the Father could be accomplished. And what's the will of the Father? that no one would perish but all come to repentance. And so everything that we have, everything that, that we think we own, it belongs to God. Now with that said, I want to underscore that the principle and the precept of stewardship is about relationship. God wants to be intimate with you and he understands that this one issue could be the issue that prevents you from experiencing the abiding life. For some, it'll be what prevents them from coming to know God at all. And so God takes this, a very, takes this very seriously. So today what I'd like to do, I want to share with you three principles of stewardship. The first is the ownership principle. The ownership principle. Listen to Psalm 24.1. The earth is the Lord's. Excuse me, the world, I got it this way. The world and all that is in it belongs to God. The earth and all who live in it are His. Psalm 24, 1. You know, this principle is really tough for people to understand. Because for some reason we think if we possess something that it's our possession. But that's not true. Yesterday, I'm working, slave in the yard. You'd have been proud of me. I had this thick area. I cleaned it all out or almost all of it. Cut down like 25 trees. Burned them all up. I mean, I was a real man yesterday. Of course, I'm feeling the pain for it today. But as I'm working in the yard, my son Colin comes out and I have me a, a big glass of Coke just to 
kind of sip on when I'm coming up for air. And as I'm, I look back, and he has picked up my Coke. And he's drinking it. And I said, son, that's mine. Don't drink it. And he goes, <laughs> and starts drinking some more. And I said, son, seriously, that's mine. Stop drinking it. And you know what that little dog did? He poured it out. He thought that drink belonged to him. I was like, what are you doing? Here's another one. Have you ever been to a preschool room? It's amazing. It's mine. It's mine. It's mine. It's mine. And they're arguing over what. And none, does it belong to them? No, it belongs to the school. We had this innate thought that because something's in my possession, something's in my hand, I own it. And that's, that's faulty thinking. God says, the earth is Lord and everything in it. You, me, everything. Everything we have. Your house, your car, your bank account, everything that you and I have, it all belongs to God. Why can I say that? Because back in Genesis 1, listen to this, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Hmm. You know what I noticed there? It didn't say in the beginning, Joey created the heavens and the earth. It didn't say art created the heavens and the earth. It didn't say Alice created the heavens and the earth. Now I realize some of you think that the way your spouse acts that they did create the earth, but they didn't. And because he created it, he owns it. He owns you. He owns me. He owns everything. And what has he done? He has allowed us to be stewards and managers of that which he's given to us. Now here's the problem. Because, just because God owns everything doesn't mean that it's being used the way that he intended for it to be used. He may have given you talents and abilities, but that doesn't mean that you're using those talents and abilities in the way that he intended for them to be used. And I'll be honest with you, I think it breaks his heart. Why? Why does it break his heart? It's not because you're misusing or I'm misusing our talents and abilities. It's because he loves us so much and desires relationship with us. And because we have taken that which he's given us, we're, we're living in rebellion of relationship rather than experiencing the beauty of the relationship he has for us. We're taking the very blessings of God and using them against our relationship when we choose to live unsurrendered to him. And yet what is stewardship all about? Relationship. It's about your relationship. And so the ownership principle basically says God owns it all. When are you going to recognize that he owns it all? And when are you going to come back and say, God, thank you for everything you've blessed me with. And God, everything you've blessed me with, it belongs to you. Uh, maybe a one way to look at it, maybe a great principle to look at it. I need something to, I'll use this. Is that we say, God, we realize you own it all. Thank you for put, blessing what you've done. But here's what I'm not going to do, God. I'm not going to grab hold of it and say, it's now mine. Instead, I'm going to allow you to use it. And so if you need to take it out and give it to someone else, that's okay. If you want to put something else in its place, that's okay too. But whatever it is, I live surrendered and I will thank you for all the blessings because I recognize you own it all. The second principle is the principle that usually causes people to run out of the church. This is the tithe, the principle of the tithe, the tithing principle. Whereas stewardship involves more than your money, here's the principle that we all need to understand. The doorway to stewardship comes through most people's wallets. Now, here's the principle. It's understanding that we, we, we need to understand that our nature is to possess, and so God's nature is to help us to relinquish that. So what does God do? God says, I own it all. I'm going to let you be a steward of 100% of it. So I'm going to ask you for the first tenth. 
Now, why does he want the first tenth? Does God need our money? Does God need your talents? Does God need your tongue? Does God need your testimony? Does God need... No, God doesn't need any of that. But what do we need? We need God. And so God says, I'm going to give all this to you, and I'm going to ask for the first tenth. Now, a really critical principle to realize here comes out of, out of, excuse me, comes out of Proverbs chapter 3, verse 9 and 10. Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of your crops. Then your barns will be filled to overflowing, and your vats brim over with new wine. Honor the Lord with the first and best. See, the principle of the tithe is not that God gets the least and the leftovers. He gets the first and the best. All through scripture, when someone brought a sacrifice that was the least and the leftovers and not the first and the best, what did God do? He rejected it. He said, no thank you. Why? Because as God is the creator, he deserves our first and best, not the least and leftovers. And so God says, I want the first and best of your talents. I want the first and best of your, of your resources. I want the first and best of your time. Not the least in the leftovers. And so he asked for this first tenth. Listen to this verse out of Matthew chapter 6. Do not store up riches for yourselves here on earth where moth and rust destroy, where robbers break in and steal. Instead, store up riches for yourself in heaven, where moth and rust cannot destroy, where robbers can't break in and steal. For your heart will always be where your riches are. You cannot be a slave of two masters. You will hate one and love the other. You will be loyal to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. You can't serve God. There cannot be two gods in your life. There can only be one. And here's the, here's the simple reality. The simple reality is either God is your God or money is your God. That, that's not my words. That's God's words. And see, man has the struggle. We like to store up things on earth. We like to amass stuff. And let me tell you, if there's any community in America that likes to amass stuff, we live in it. We are a over-blessed community. We really are. And the sad, sad part is that this blessing has caused many people, just like Jesus said it would, to miss heaven. And yet, what does God desire for us? Relationship. Relationship. And so what does God do? He says, I want you to give me the first tenth. The first and best portion. I want you to bring it to me. In fact, he actually says, I want you to bring it to the storehouse. If you have your Bibles, you might want to write this verse down. Malachi chapter 3 verse 10. It says, bring the whole tithe. How much of the tithe? How much is that? How much is the whole tithe? All of it. 100% of it. He says, bring the whole tithe to the storehouse. The storehouse is the temple. The storehouse is the place where you worship. So it's not bring 5% and then give 5% to somewhere else. It's to bring your whole tithe to the place where you worship. It's to bring, all your, it's to bring the first tenth of your talents to the place that you worship so that your, your gifts and abilities can be used. And so he says, bring the whole tithe. Test me in this and see if I'll not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that you will not have room for it. How many of you would like more blessing in your life? God's principle is bring the first and best tenth to the storehouse, the place where you worship, so that he can bless you. Now, again, it's about relationship. And so what is the tithe? In its basic form, the tithe is the simple reminder that God desires a relationship with you and he wants to make sure that nothing in this world, nothing, takes precedence over him. And so he says, I want the first and best tenth. I, I, a couple of years ago, there was a church in Fort Worth, Texas that was just booming. I mean, they were growing so fast. They, they were in, they're kind of like an area like we are, a little bit landlocked. And they were buying up houses around them, literally tearing the houses down to build parking. 
And they still couldn't keep up with what was going on. And there was a parking lot right across the street from the church. It was a grocery store. And so they approached the grocery store and said, and who, who happened to be a believer, actually happened to attend the church. And they said, look, we are just dying for parking. Can we on Sunday mornings, you don't open until noon, can we on Sunday mornings park in your parking lot? And the, and the man said, oh, absolutely. At, there's no problem. If, we can, if it can be used to help reach more people for Christ, you can use our parking lot under one condition. And they go, okay, what's that condition? He says, you can use it for 51 of 52 weeks a year, but one week a year you can't use it, and I'm not going to tell you which Sunday that is. And they're like, well, that's crazy. Why would you? He goes, because I don't want, ever, I don't want anyone to ever forget that the church doesn't own this parking lot. The grocery store owns the parking lot. That really is the same principle here. God says, I want you to give that first tenth because I don't want you to ever forget who really owns all this stuff. And so he's trying to teach us what it means. In Deuteronomy chapter 14, verse 22, they're talking about the tithe. And it says that believers are to give the first tenth of all their profits and blessings back to God. Listen to this. Be sure to set aside the first tenth of all your fields that they produce each year. And then verse 23, it tells us why. So that you may learn to revere the Lord your God always. I like the way the Living Bible puts it. The purpose of tithing is to teach us to put God first in every situation. So where does my tithe go? My first tenth of my time, talents, tongue, treasure, temple, testimony, it comes to the place where I worship, the storehouse of God. When do I give? Whenever I have received a blessing of profit from God, I'm to take that first tenth and as an act of faith, as an act of obedience, return it to the Father. And that's the principle of the tithe. Third principle, the treasure principle. The treasure principle is realizing that everything that we have is a blessing from God. Everything. My health, everything. But it's also understanding that I am going to, as a steward, walk through this doorway of obedience, walk through this doorway of faith, and I'm going to trust that God's going to take care of me. There's a great story about J.D. Rockefeller, one of the wealthiest men who ever lived, and upon his death, Someone went up to his accountant and they said, wow, he has all this. And, and, the, and he just simply asked a question. He says, how much did he leave? And the accountant said, all of it. See, the treasure principle is we're to store up things not on this earth, but in heaven. We're not to allow the things of this earth to take away. In Luke chapter 6, it says, give and it will be given to you. Good measure, crushed down, full of running over, they will give to you. For the same measure as you give, it will be given back to you. And this brings me back to what I shared a little bit as we we're taking our offering this morning. There are three different types of gifts, all of them led by the Spirit. You can say, oh, but the tithe, that's an act of obedience. It is an act of obedience. But if the Holy Spirit comes and taps you on the shoulder and says, hey, I'd like to, for you to give to help a child to go to camp this year, do you still not have a responsibility to be obedient? All of stewardship is led by the Spirit of God. All of stewardship is to be an act of obedience. And so God says there are three places. First is the tithe. The tithe is the first tenth. And it is not just scripturally mandated, it is Holy Spirit mandated. And so I'm to bring the tithe. Then he says, here are the types of offerings. The first type of offering is a seed faith offering. And I, I kind of explained that earlier, but seed faith is where I'm saying, God, I have this little. I'm going to ask you to make it much. I'm going to plant this seed whether it's a penny, a dollar, a hundred dollars, whatever it is, you're saying, God, how can I do it? I'll, I'll be honest with you. Every single week, I give a seed faith offering. Because I'm saying to God, God, I want you to take this gift and use it to glorify yourself through the world. 
It's not, it's, it's just a little. In fact, most weeks it's about a dollar. Some weeks it's been whatever I, change I had in my pockets. But I never want to allow the offering plate to pass. Because see, to be honest with you, my wife pays our tithe. And so I never want the offering plate to pass in which I cannot put something in and I always put a seed faith in unless God tells me to do something above and beyond that. A second type of offering that God asks us to give is a grave gift. This is a one-time gift. It's a one-time gift to bless someone or to respond to a situation. So for example, a couple months, couple months ago, we had the group from Liberty here. And we, we, we had a love offering. for them. That would be a grace gift offering. And all through the scriptures, in fact, in 1 in, in Corinthians, Paul went to the, to the churches in Asia Minor and asked for a grace gift so he could take it to Jerusalem to help that church. And so there are many times, I'll be honest with you, we have several, several opportunities for people to give grace gifts. We have mission trips coming. We have a trip going to Canada, a trip going to Nicaragua. We have a trip going to Africa. Where else are we going? There's our students are going on a trip. We have kids going to camps. We have, uh, we have lots of people that feel called to go but don't have the financial resources to go. And they're trying to be obedient. And they're saying, God, how do you want me to do it? That's where we can take a one-time gift. One thing that we're talking about doing, and we have not settled on this with the missions team, but I would love for us to have an annual missions giving.